Jones lifting it to left. And at long last, for the first time in their 43-year history, the Astros have won a postseason series. What the game lacked in drama, it had plenty of it in emotion. With the passing of Ken Caminiti, very much on the minds of many of these Houston players. Let's go to Pam Oliver. All right, here with Jeff Bagwell. I know it hasn't been an easy day for you with what with uh, the loss of Ken Caminetti. How did you pull through? Well, you know, I, I realized that Cammy would only want it one way, and that's to go out and play hard and, and get a win. And, um, you know, I, I'm sure going to miss him a ton. And, um, you know, that's that's a tough thing to, to have to go through. But, uh, you know, tonight uh, we were fortunate enough to get a win, and, and that's what we're happy about now. The Houston Astros won their first playoff series in franchise history on October 11, 2004. The Astros played Game 5 at Turner Field with heavy hearts, as the team learned of the passing of Ken Caminiti just the night before. Ken was only 41 years old and was eight years removed from being the unanimous National League MVP. Less than one week earlier, the case of the state of Texas versus Kenneth Gene Caminiti had been resolved after three long years. With his guilty plea on October 5th, Caminiti was a free man and a felon. He was depressed, but also somewhat optimistic about trying to get and stay sober. He told people he had plans to head up to a cabin in Montana on a piece of property that he owned. He wanted to get away from Houston and some of the bad influences there. He even invited his agent, Rick Licht, to come bow hunting with him and told him to tell Padres manager Bruce Bochy that he was coming for his job in a few years. Caminiti's attorney, Terry Yates, was with Ken in the holding cell the day before his hearing. He said that Cammy both looked and sounded good. He was praying a lot and seemed really committed this time. It seemed as if he had finally hit rock bottom and things could only get better. And more importantly, he wanted to get better. He was sentenced to 180 days in jail, but was given credit for 189 days served and was released on October 5th. Ken changed out of his prison jumpsuit and into street clothes. He went to the gym and worked out, then visited his neighbors, Alba and Dita Effington. He came over and gave me a bear hug. As he was hugging me, he says, well, I let you down. I broke my promise to you, but it's not gonna happen again, Alba told ESPN in 2004. From this day on, I'm going to get help and I'm going to get my head clear. Ken told him that he was going to travel to see Maria Romero's son in New York, but promised to be back to pick up his two yellow labs, Casey and Candy, to take to Montana with him. He was to fly to Florida to get Maria, and then from Florida to New York to speak with her son, who was having problems with drugs. Ken was going to try to get him straightened out, and had already pledged to pay to send him to a military school in Texas. Caminiti's previous attorney, Kent Schaefer, told ESPN, we urged him in very strong terms not to get involved to the point of actually going to New York because of the toxic relationship between him and Maria. But despite that, Caminiti packed his bags and headed to the airport. This is Secondary Lead, the rise and fall of Ken Caminiti. A 10-part series on the life and career of one of the most important baseball players of the 80s and 90s. If you like this show, please click subscribe and leave a rating or a review. And now, Chapter 10, The Final Days. The Houston Astros defeated the Atlanta Braves 9-3 in Game 1 of the 2004 National League Division Series on Wednesday, October 6, 2004. Brad Osmus, wearing Caminiti's old number 11, hit one of four home runs for the Astros as they took a 1-0 series lead. That night, Caminiti boarded a plane from Houston and flew to Tampa, Florida to see Maria Romero. According to the Ethingtons and two other friends, Caminiti had several thousand dollars on him when he left Texas. On Thursday, October 7th, the Braves beat the Astros 4-2 in Game 2. It was a marathon 11-inning affair, 
with Rafael Fercal hitting a walk-off home run against Dan Maselli. Maselli had been a key member of the bullpen for the 1998 San Diego Padres and had a great season with the Astros in 04. That day, Caminiti and Romero flew from Tampa to New York and checked into the Marriott Hotel in Queens. According to a statement given by Romero to ESPN, sometime after midnight, the couple took a taxi to an apartment on Troutman Street in the Bushwick section of Brooklyn, where her 15-year-old son lived with his father and Maria's ex, Rob Silva. Silva was a 35-year-old who had served four prison sentences for drugs, three times for selling and once for possession. He said that he had met Caminiti about a year and a half prior, when Maria had brought him to a party. In early October 2004, Silva was on parole for the attempted sale of drugs. Silva told reporters that Caminiti called him on Friday. During that conversation, Silva mentioned that his son had been arrested on drug charges and he wanted Ken to come talk to him. This is the first of many red flags in Silva's story. We know that the entire purpose of Caminiti's trip to New York was to talk to Silva's son. And yet here, he makes it seem like this was something that organically came up in conversation. Silva said that when Ken talked to his son, he asked him, do you want to live or do you want to die? My son stood quiet for a second and then said, I want to live. And then Ken said, all right then. Rob said he was grateful to Ken for coming to help his son out. He claimed that the next time he heard from Caminiti was early in the morning of Sunday, October 10th. On Friday, October 8th, the Astros and Braves had the day off to travel from Atlanta to Houston. On the off day, Dale Robertson of the Houston Chronicle wrote about Ken Caminiti. He talked with Jeff Bagwell, who said, I can't tell you what Cammy's going through because I haven't really been there, but my thoughts and prayers are with him and his family. I feel for him. I really do. We were baseball players, but we were friends first, and I'll always be thankful for that. It's sad to see. I think about him all the time. I hope the time will come when I can talk to him. At this point, neither Bagwell nor Craig Biggio had spoken with Caminiti for at very least months, if not years. San Diego Padres owner John Moores still lived in Houston and told Robertson that he had hoped to take Caminiti to Saturday's Astros Braves game, but that Cammy was out of town. He said that Ken would be more than welcome with the Padres if he could stay sober. Moores said, bringing him back on the heels of his having failed his drug program just wouldn't be the right thing for us to do. First, he needs to get in charge of his life in the same way he was in charge of his baseball career. A year earlier, Moores thought he could help Caminiti by bringing him back into the Padres family. He now realized that wouldn't work. The Houston Astros took a two games to one series lead over the Braves on Saturday, October 9th. It was an eight to five win for the Astros, who were now just one win away from winning their first ever postseason series and vanquishing Atlanta. It has been reported that Ken and Maria were at Maria's mother's apartment that day for a family birthday party. But that isn't exactly true. Here's what Maria told Secondary Lead. On the 9th, we went to my mother's house, and my mother ended up in the hospital. So we went there so that I can watch my nephews while she came out of the hospital. Well, she never came out of the hospital. They admitted her. And Ken left on the 9th. I remember he kind of got an itch. And I was like, well, I'm not going nowhere. And he, like I said, there was, if he wanted, whatever he wanted to do, he was gonna do. A photograph of Ken and Maria from that day shows his graying hair covered beneath the Philadelphia 76ers cap. Maria rests her head on his left shoulder. Neither are smiling, but they seem happy. Romero looks quietly content while Caminiti playfully glares not at the camera, but at the photographer with his eyebrow raised. Maria says Ken didn't do drugs in all the time they spent together that week. What's unclear is how much time they spent apart. Merce Alcepeda was the building superintendent at 1220 Seneca Avenue in the Hunts Point section of the Bronx. It is a six-story brown brick building with the office of an HVAC contractor on the ground floor and tenement apartments above. Cepeda told T.J. Quinn of the New York Daily News 
that he remembers letting Caminiti into the building on Saturday, October 9th. I thought he was maybe a parole officer or something. I didn't pay him no mind. 41-year-old Angel Gonzalez lived in the building, in apartment 4B. Gonzalez was a convicted drug dealer and an associate of Rob Silva. The two had met when both were in jail on drug charges at the Hudson Correctional Facility in upstate New York. Police sources told Quinn that Caminiti spent Saturday and Sunday in Hunts Point, hanging out with two men with drug dealing convictions, presumably Gonzalez and Silva. It was reported by ESPN in 2004 that Caminiti woke Maria Romero up at 4 a.m. on Sunday, October 10th. She said there was nothing unusual about him, as he told her he was going to the hotel to pack for their return flight to Houston that afternoon. He left the Bushwick apartment with $24 in his wallet. Phone records obtained by ESPN show that Ken made three calls from his cell phone to Maria's brother Hector, one at 4.14 a.m., another at 4.16, and a third at 4.52. Hector Romero was a convicted drug dealer. Between the second and third calls, Caminiti contacted Rob Silva. According to Silva, this was the first time the two had spoken since Friday. He says they met in a park across the street from Maria's mother's apartment and talked. Silva says Ken was edgy and sweating as they talked about a variety of topics ranging from how much he loved his family, how drugs and alcohol were ruining his life, and how he felt he had disappointed everyone around him. Silva found him depressed. Caminiti and Silva got in a taxi from the park and went to the hotel. Shortly after 6 a.m., Caminiti made two phone calls from his cell phone to American Express. Records obtained by ESPN show a cash advance of $1,025 from Amex to Caminiti went through at 6.47 a.m. Between 7.30 and 8 a.m., Ken called Maria's mother's apartment six times. Maria told ESPN that it was because he was looking for money in the hotel room that he had left there and couldn't find, a sum of about $400. Rob Silva said that they found themselves walking around Hunts Point and that Rob knew a friend who lived nearby. He says that he called Angel Gonzalez at around 8 a.m. and woke him up. They decided that Silva would come over and watch football that afternoon, and Rob said he would bring a friend. Caminiti's hotel bill shows a call placed at 8.40 a.m. to Gonzalez from Caminiti's room, which makes Silva's account highly unlikely. Eight more phone calls were made by Caminiti to Romero's mother's apartment from 8.57 to 9.04. In this time, he allegedly told Maria he was coming home, but he never showed up. Instead, at 9.23, a taxi was dispatched to the hotel, and Caminiti and Silva took a ride to Hunts Point. The driver told ESPN it took 25 minutes to reach the destination, and he was paid $68 for the fare and tolls. Silva says that Caminiti went into a store to buy a cell phone and a portable video camera as presents. Rob claimed that he didn't see much money or any drugs in Caminiti's possession at the time. He noted that he was sweating, but otherwise looked fine. The high temperature recorded in the Bronx that day was 68 degrees. A call was placed from Caminiti's cell phone to Angel Gonzalez's apartment at 10.13 a.m. As time passed and Ken never returned, Maria got worried. Around noon, she called their travel agent and found out that he canceled their plane tickets that afternoon early in the morning. At 1 p.m., Silva and Caminiti arrived at Gonzalez's apartment. Gonzalez was a huge baseball fan and claims that when Silva showed up, he recognized Caminiti and was thrilled to be hosting him. Silva says, I wanted him to meet Ken, and he was excited, you know what I'm saying? Then, everything just got messed up. Around the time that Silva and Caminiti showed up at apartment 4B at 1220 Seneca Avenue, Game 4 of the NLDS began at Minute Maid Park in Houston. Led by a three-run home run by Craig Biggio in the bottom of the second, the Astros took an early 5-2 lead. 
In the Bronx, Silva, Gonzalez, and Caminiti were tuned in to the New York Giants Dallas Cowboys football game. According to the story told by Gonzalez and Silva, at halftime, Gonzalez left the apartment to pick up fried chicken and beer from a local store. The New York Jets were hosting the Buffalo Bills at 4 p.m., and they were getting ready to hunker down for the contest. Ken went to use the bathroom while Angel went to buy some chicken, Silva said. Next thing I know, he came out of the bathroom. Ken tapped his chest and said, I'm not feeling good, and collapsed to the floor. Silva remembers, at that moment, everything went like blank. I was freaking out. First time I'd ever seen anything like that happen. Gonzalez came back and found Silva giving Cammy CPR. He went into the bathroom and there were no signs of drug use. Both Gonzalez and Silva deny seeing Caminiti use drugs that day. Angel Gonzalez said that he didn't think Caminiti was overdosing because he didn't exhibit the usual signs. A 911 call was placed from Gonzalez's apartment at 3.36 p.m., and an ambulance arrived two minutes later. NYPD officer Suzanne Brenneman of the 41st Precinct was the first on the scene. Merceal Cepeda says that he saw paramedics carrying Caminiti out of the apartment while trying to revive him, but he was already dead. This is not exactly true, as ESPN reports that Caminiti was still in cardiac arrest at 4.20 p.m., when he arrived at the emergency room at Lincoln Medical Center. Doctors tried to revive him, but it was too late. At 6.45 p.m. Eastern Time, on Sunday, October 10, 2004, Ken Caminiti was pronounced dead in the Bronx, New York. There were only $3 left in his wallet. Sometime after that, Rick Licht received a phone call that there was a dead man in a hospital in New York who looked like it could be Ken. He gave the person on the other end of the phone a description, including Ken's tattoos, notably including the names of his three daughters on his chest. A few minutes later, the person called back and confirmed it was him. Maria Romero still hadn't heard anything and was growing increasingly worried throughout the day. She frantically called both Silva and Caminiti to try to get in touch. I called, and I kept calling, and he wouldn't pick up his phone, and Ken wouldn't pick up his phone. So finally, when I got a hold of him, he told me that, you know, they, they were hanging out, and that they had to call the, the ambulance because Ken got sick, and that Ken had died. And I was like, what? I didn't believe it. I, I, you know, I just thought it was a bad joke. But then I called the hospital and they wouldn't give me any information. So I had to show them that I had flu with Ken, the whole time, um, that I had any, any relationship with, with Ken. And then they took me to a room and they called the doctor, they called the nurse, um, and they told me, the doctors were the ones that told me that had passed. It wasn't good. She was in shock and couldn't believe what she had been told. I stood in the hospital for a while. Because I I wanted to see for myself. But we couldn't get anyone to take me downstairs to the morgue. And my sister-in-law who was with me, she was like, Tata, the doctors are not going to lie to you. And I'm like, yeah, but I haven't seen him. But then the TV, we went by this room and the TV was on and they had Ken on the screen. <sighs> and then I just hung out there for a while to see if I can find someone, but that never happened, so I went home, and I got on the computer, and all I could find was Ken, articles of Ken. I don't know how many hours I spent on that computer, telling my kids was the hard part.
news of Caminiti's death was barely mentioned in news reports on Monday, October 11th. It was overshadowed by the death of actor and activist Christopher Reeve, who had been famously paralyzed in an equestrian accident in 1995 and whose death dominated the headlines the next day. Reeve passed away within hours of Caminiti, at a hospital in Westchester County, New York, right around 30 miles north of the Bronx. As Hollywood mourned the loss of its Superman, the loss of baseball Superman rocked the sport. It's true that Caminiti had been estranged from baseball, save for his brief spring training with the Padres in 04, but that didn't mean that he wasn't loved. Mark Sweeney, Phil Plantier, Merv Retmond, Chris Donalds, and John Covington all remember how they felt finding out. He was almost a, a big brother to me. The disappointment of losing him and, and the way it was was horrific. Well, there's frustration. You're sad and you're frustrated because here's a guy who really was on top of the world and then just went the other direction. Those challenges kind of took his life over a little bit. He obviously deteriorated, so just sadness and frustration. And as I mentioned earlier, like, gosh, the time that I spend with him, like, like why didn't I see that? You know, questioning myself, like, why didn't you see it? You know, because if you see it, then you can talk to a guy. You never know if you can help somebody. We had a mutual friend, and it was an attorney out of L.A. And he would call me every time Cam and Eddie got picked up on drugs. And honest to gosh, the night he called me and told me that he was dead, I think he was a little relieved that his family, his wife and his girls, didn't have to go through it anymore. A lot of grief, a lot of uh, guilt, I guess, too, because being as close to him as a teammate that we were, that how could things go so far south? I, it's hard for me to get my head around it type of thing. I mean, it was for a guy who was such a big, strong, athletic dude um, to, to be taken down by something like that. I mean, he's not the first and he won't be the last, but um, it just shows you how scary drugs could be for a good part of his life. I mean, he had the best of everything. So I, I, I really, I wish I could have done more to help him. Now that looking back, I mean, it's... Like I said, for, for a guy who had a life people would have cut the right arm off for, um, it's a tragic demise, in my opinion. Um, I was shocked. I, I you know, I, I, I had heard that he was he was going to get out again, and I was looking forward to seeing him, and I didn't hear a word from him when he got out. And then the strangest thing was I ended up having to defend him because most people were there's a guy, another rich baseball player, just dumb, you know, goes and kills himself. And, and I go, it's a little more complicated than that, but nobody really wants to feel sorry for a guy that's had it all, you know? So he was I don't think he got much support or, or anybody really understood how conflicted he was with the major life change that was going on with his, uh, you know, career ending and, and you know, trouble with the law and, also, I think he just he just hooked up his his uh, wagon to the first people that seemed like they were sympathetic with his plight, and I think all they wanted was being part of. The Atlanta Braves had come back to win Game Four of the NLDS six to five, setting up a decisive Game Five in Atlanta on Monday night. Richard Justice was there, covering the series for the Houston Chronicle. The day he died. Uh, the Astros are in Atlanta, um, 2004, for a postseason series. And I just, it was very early in the afternoon, and I just uh, kind of wandered on the field. And nobody was on the field at that hour. And I went over to the visiting dugout, and there was Craig Biggio, alone, not saying anything. And it was just the pain. Now, I think in a lot of ways, Craig had given up on Ken. I think he thought, I got to help. My wife Patty and I have to take care of the family. We have to be there for the family. And um, there was, he was sitting alone in his thoughts, but there was such pain in that man's face. And uh, I didn't ask any questions. I just kind of stood there, we, we were close. And, 
and, and he just looked up at one point and said, um, if you needed a dollar and Cammy only had one dollar, he'd give you that dollar, then he'd give you the shirt off his back and he'd give you his shoes. That's who the guy was. And uh, man, I thought about that so many times because you know how it is when you come up, you know, when you're part of a group like that, they, part, they are in your family forever. The grief weighed heavily on the Astros, who sought to finally end their postseason drought while digesting the news that their dear friend was gone. Houston jumped out to an early lead led by two home runs by Carlos Beltran. The center fielder, who was acquired in a mid-season trade with Kansas City, hit four homers in the series, breaking Caminiti's club record for the most in a single postseason series. In the seventh inning, Jeff Bagwell hit a two-run home run, and three hours and 12 minutes after first pitch, Chipper Jones flew out to the warning track in left field for the final out of the game. Houston won running away, 12-3. The Astros were a team that had dealt with great loss in the previous 18 months. In June 2002, longtime Houston pitcher Darryl Kyle passed away at the age of 33 from heart disease. Caminiti's death on the heels of that was emotionally devastating for the core that played with both. Brad Osmus remembers taking the field that day. It was, you know, it's strange to lose. I'm kind of lumping them together here now, but it's strange to lose two teammates at such a young age. Um, but, you know, more than anything at that point, I think we were mostly concerned about his three daughters. But it wasn't a lot of fun going on on the field. And there are a few times when, when you lose someone that's important to you or was an important part of your life. To tell you the truth, stepping on the field and playing is it's kind of a refuge where you don't have to think about the, the things that are ha- circling around you off the field. So playing actually sometimes becomes easier than sitting in the hotel room. Your mind is it was a muted celebration for Houston. I think I felt his spirit out there, Craig Biggio said. I know he's smiling somewhere, Jeff Bagwell chipped in. One of the biggest attributes Ken had was his heart, Bagwell continued to reporters. How our relationship developed and all the great things he's meant to my life, I think if you start with his heart and how great a person he was, that's a good way to remember him. Caminiti's memorial service in Houston was filled with baseball people wanting to pay their respects to the ultimate teammate and gamer. Padres owner John Moores chartered a plane so that scores of San Diego personnel could attend. Phil Nevin, who was a teammate of Ken Caminiti's, uh, he and I uh, flew to Houston to be there for the, for the funeral. The representation around baseball at that funeral, which some people might say, well, what, what, what are you doing? What do you support? I was a former teammate of all the stuff I alluded to earlier. That's the reason why I wanted to be there. I cried my eyes out. Um, but we, we lost a friend. We lost a guy that uh, uh, was a teammate. I think a lot of uh, situations and people would would uh, feel that way. But do you get past the element of how it happened? It has everything to do with you being there uh, because we lost we lost a friend. Craig Reynolds was one of many speakers that day and he spoke directly to Caminiti's three daughters when he said, you're going to hear some really, really good things about your dad here today. And later, after you leave, you're gonna hear some bad things about your dad. And when you do, remember that those people didn't know him the way that everybody in this room did. Initial media reports were that Caminiti died of a heart attack, but in the days and weeks after his death, rumors swirled that drugs were likely involved. On November 1st, the chief medical examiner's office in New York City released the results of Ken's autopsy. It listed the cause of death as acute intoxication due to the combined effects of cocaine and opiates. In layman's terms, Caminiti died of an overdose of a mixture of cocaine and heroin. It was news that nobody wanted to see. The autopsy showed coronary artery disease 
and an enlarged heart as contributing factors to the death. While steroid use did not kill Ken Caminiti, their use did contribute to his disease running its fatal course. What still remains a mystery to this day is exactly what happened in those final two days. I can't make sense of it either. All I know is, is that he had no business being with my ex-husband, number one. Number two, Ken didn't know anybody in the Bronx. And number three, I think that they should have looked into it more than what they did. I don't believe that story that Ken just ended up in the Bronx and money was missing from his wallet and that, no, I, I, I don't know why they didn't look into it. They said that there was no foul play. Okay, there was no foul play. I don't think he had any business with my ex-husband. That's just what I think. I, I don't think Ken was that stupid. I also read that there was, um, that Ken had taken out some money from one of his cards but when they found him, they had, he had no money in his wallet. Where's all that money Ken took out? We have no reason to trust Rob Silva or Angel Gonzalez. Both Silva and Gonzalez have motive to lie. Silva was on probation at the time, and for him to admit that he was around drug use knowingly would not be good. With both Silva's and Gonzalez's rap sheets, they could both be looking at legal troubles. It certainly seems as if they, at very least, made up parts of their story to cover their own rear ends. Silva's version of the story differs from all other accounts in significant ways. The timeline of when he and Ken got to Hunt's Point and Gonzalez's apartment doesn't match up with phone and taxi records. Silva says that he and Ken were walking around Hunt's Point at 8 a.m., but phone records put them in a Queens hotel room at 8.40. The taxi driver says he dropped Ken and Rob off at Hunts Point around 9.50 in the morning, but we're also told by Gonzalez that they showed up at his place around 1 p.m. That's roughly three hours of missing time that can't be accounted for by the explanation of buying a cell phone and a video camera. Exactly what happened from the time that Caminiti and Silva arrived in Hunts Point at around 10 in the morning to the point that they showed up at Angel Gonzalez's apartment at one in the afternoon is unknown. Then there's the claim made by Silva and Gonzalez that Sunday was the first time that Caminiti and Gonzalez met. There's a witness who puts Caminiti at the apartment building on Saturday, and that's backed up by police sources. If the pair had never met, why did Caminiti call Gonzalez from his cell phone at quarter after 10? There's the question of what happened to all of Ken's money, and maybe the most important question. How do two guys who were in the drug scene not notice that Ken was on enough drugs that he overdosed? 16 years later, we still don't have the answers. Before I die, that man is gonna have to tell me what really happened with Ken, or before he dies, because I know that there I, I know that there was more. I, I can, you, can, you can just feel that. Over the summer, Secondary Lead acquired the redacted police report from the NYPD through a Freedom of Information Laws request. The report, though, provides no answers. Officer Suzanne Brenneman, now retired from the police force, did not respond to multiple interview requests. Baseball Commissioner Bud Selig ordered a moment of silence before the start of the National and American League Championship Series. In St. Louis, where the Cardinals hosted the Astros, and at Yankee Stadium in the Bronx, just over two miles from 1220 Seneca Avenue, players lined up and bowed their heads in remembrance of Caminiti. I think it was a meaningful way to remember him, Selig said of his decision to honor Caminiti, which was controversial in that paying tribute to a steroid user and drug addict was still a touchy subject in 2004. Both Selig and Rob Manfred, then MLB's senior VP for business and labor, said that Caminiti's steroid revelations had a significant impact on the game. Today the tide has shifted, and some steroid users have been embraced. Mark McGuire and Barry Bonds have both had jobs as MLB hitting coaches. Alex Rodriguez has improbably become liked by the baseball establishment and came close to actually owning the New York Mets in 2020. Many fans believe steroid users should be enshrined in the Baseball Hall of Fame. If Ken Caminiti was still alive, 
it's likely that baseball would be wrapping its arms around him, and he would no longer be the pariah that he was in the early 2000s. Even in death, the fallout from his steroid admission continued. Baseball had issued its first punishments for positive steroid tests during the 2004 season, but they were laughably light. The first offense didn't even carry a suspension. Congress, concerned with the effects of pro athlete steroid usage on kids, put pressure on MLB for tougher penalties. On January 13th, MLB announced a new drug agreement, which levied a 10-day suspension for a first offense, 30 days for a second, 60 days for a third, and a one-year ban for a fourth. A fifth violation left punishment at the discretion of the commissioner. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Rafael Palmero, and I am a professional baseball player. I'll be brief in my remarks today. Let me start by telling you this. I have never used steroids, period. I do not know how to say it any more clearly than that. Never. On March 17th, a panel of players and ex-players testified in front of the House Government Reform Committee. We've heard clips from this hearing throughout the series. It's where Jose Canseco testified that steroids were as acceptable as a cup of coffee and repeated his 85% number. Canseco echoed the thoughts of a lot of players at the time that steroids were not bad if properly used and there was little stigma to using them. Mark McGuire went to Washington ready to admit to using steroids, but on the advice of his lawyer, he didn't. Instead, he told the committee that he was not going to talk about his past. In the clip you just heard, Rafael Palmero emphatically whacked his finger at Congress and denied using steroids. Fewer than five months later, on August 1st, 2005, Palmero was suspended for 10 days after testing positive for stenozolol, a potent anabolic steroid also known as Winstraw. Like when Rafael Palmero got caught, people say, well, the, the, the punishment was so lax. But what people like me thought was, incorrectly as it turned out, the stain on his reputation would be the pun ultimate punishment. And I guess ultimately, 50 years from now, that will be the ultimate punishment. But at the time, it didn't seem to scare anyone off. And everybody thought, what's your good name worth? Your reputation is going to be ruined. You know, if you're going to do it, that's what you're going to risk. But what the players saw was, I'm going to risk 10 games suspension, but I might score an $80 million contract. Let's go do it. After the 2005 season, baseball got tougher on performance enhancing drugs. A first offense now resulted in a 50 game suspension, the second, 100 games, and the third, a lifetime ban. Stimulants were also banned including the amphetamines which were once so freely available in clubhouses. In 2014, penalties were again increased, 80 games for a first offense and 162, a full season for a second offense. On April 21, 2005, the San Diego Padres played the Colorado Rockies at Petco Park in San Diego. On the night that would have been Ken's 42nd birthday, the Padres held Ken Caminiti night. I was still playing, and they and they had a, a John Moore's, the owner at the time, had a, a Ken Caminiti night, and he took a lot of heat for that because there were a lot of people that were still was, the story was fresh in his mind. And I was there with Trevor Hoffman and also Andy Ashby, a good teammate of mine, um, and we sat there, and the girls were in front of us um, with the jerseys. And they're showing videos of him and the, and the fans are reacting in a positive way, in a really uh, heartfelt way. And it was a good feel for us um, because that's, that's what we remember. That's the way we want to think of him. Trevor Hoffman said it was good for Ken's three daughters, Kendall, Lindsay, and Nicole, to see the love he got that night. A lot of negative things had been said and written about him in the wake of his passing and he was happy they got to see what he meant to his teammates and the people of San Diego. Ken Caminiti appeared on the Baseball Hall of Fame ballot in 2007. Cal Ripken Jr. and Tony Gwynn were both enshrined that year on their first ballot. Caminiti received only two votes, not coming close to enough support to stay on the ballot. One of the votes came from Gwen Knapp, who was then a columnist at the San Francisco Chronicle. She explained her vote in 2014 to Bleacher Report. Knapp said, 
I think he did a service to the game. People who do tell the truth are ostracized, as I believe Ken was. I don't know if he did it for noble reasons, but I'm sure baseball wouldn't have implemented testing that quickly without him. I think that was a big motivating factor. He went on the record, which maybe wasn't the wisest thing for him to do for himself. Ken Caminiti has been posthumously inducted into the San Jose Sports Hall of Fame and the San Jose State University Athletics Hall of Fame. The Astros just began a team Hall of Fame in 2019, and Ken Caminiti has not been among the 22 players inducted in the first two classes. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Petco Park for this amazing occasion for, quite frankly, an amazing ball player. No, in fact, no, more than a ball player. More than a ball player. And if I'm preaching to the choir, forgive me, because if you were here, you know this. You absolutely know this, that you'd never seen a player like this, a man like this. It was as if God had taken a great third baseman like Mike Schmidt and, and, and crossed him with John Wayne and Clint Eastwood, Charles Bronson. He was all of that, and that's not an exaggeration. I would like to ask Ron Fowler, Nancy, Kendall, Nicole, and Lindsay to step over here to the plaque and have Ron do the honors to officially, at this moment, induct number 21, Ken Caminiti, into the Padres Hall of Fame. In 2016, the San Diego Padres inducted Caminiti into the Padres Hall of Fame as part of a two-member class. It was Caminiti and San Diego native Ted Williams, widely regarded as the greatest hitter in baseball history, who began his legendary career with the minor league San Diego Padres in the 1930s. During the 2020 MLB playoffs, the Padres honored the 1984 and 1998 NL champion teams by placing plastic cutouts of the players behind home plate. In the seats of honor, in the first row behind the right-handed batter's box, were cutouts of Bruce Bochy, Tony Gwynn, Trevor Hoffman, and smiling for the world to see, Ken Caminiti. Throughout the last 10 weeks, I've referenced a 2014 article in Bleacher Report several times. Written by Scott Miller, it's called The Cautionary Tale of Ken Caminiti, The Steroid Era's First Truth Teller. And that's a good way to put it. Cammy is a cautionary tale, but not about the dangers of drug use or steroids. Of course we know those things are dangerous, and we don't need Ken to serve as the cautionary tale. The hard truth is Ken Caminiti's story is one that baseball and American society should reflect upon, and in it, see our own shortcomings. That is the real cautionary tale. We need to be better about how we treat those in our lives who are struggling. Baseball chose to learn nothing from the Pittsburgh drug scandal and the tragedy of Rod Scurry. Scurry's tale, arrested for buying crack one day after his release from Major League Baseball, and passing away from a heart attack brought on by drug use is so parallel to Caminiti's. Rather than using what happened to Scurry to do anything to help ball players who were using drugs, baseball simply pretended the problem didn't exist. Steroids and drugs of abuse were ever present, and both MLB and the union refused to make them a front burner issue. In fact, baseball only started testing players for cocaine and opioids in 2020 a reaction to the tragic passing of Los Angeles Angels pitcher Tyler Skaggs during the 2019 season. But of course, baseball's policies and actions were guided by society. In the 1980s, America was ramping up the war on drugs, and people were being told to just say no. Drugs were demonized, and so was anyone who used them. Baseball had a pure, all-American apple pie image to uphold, and to do so, they had to project an image of a drug-free sport, even if that denied reality. In the past few years, change has taken root, but too late for Caminiti and many others who needed help. After Ken's passing in 2004, Caminiti's attorney Terry Yates said, I don't want to get on my soapbox too much, 
But the criminal justice system criminalizes drug offenders and puts them in handcuffs and puts them in an orange jumpsuit and puts them in front of the cameras. They dehumanize them. They embarrass them in front of their family and friends. That really causes a loss of self-esteem. Maybe that's what happened in Ken's case as he became comfortable and identified with people in his same situation who felt like they didn't look down on him. Maybe that's why he continued to run with these people. Yates is hardly alone in thinking that. Even before he was ever arrested, Ken had self-esteem and self-hate problems. The treatment he received at the hands of the law likely only contributed to that. Many people have tried to blame Maria Romero over the years, and since she was an outsider, she is a convenient target. But that's completely unfair to Maria and her situation, and a burden that she shouldn't have to bear. What we're left with is the harsh reality that even if baseball, society, and the criminal justice system were perfect, that might not have saved Ken Caminiti. Addiction and depression are horrible diseases that claim lives, and the tragedy of it is that sometimes even the best we're capable of just isn't enough to save someone. And of course, there's also the stigma of mental health, which through the tireless work of many is slowly starting to disappear but 20 years ago was prevalent. We don't know exactly why Ken never got treatment for his depression as Maria wanted, but he was a tough guy who did things for himself. At that time, tough guys didn't go to therapy. Kelly Candell wrote the story for the film A League of Their Own about his mother's experience in the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. His brother Casey was a teammate of Ken's with the Astros from 1988 to 1993. Kelly wrote a tribute to Caminiti, which appeared in the New York Times on October 17, 2004. He wrote, Tragedy, in its classical theatrical sense, is the idea that a character in a drama can crystallize some central dynamics that are present in a whole society. I don't know what larger lessons society can learn from Caminiti's death. There will be calls for more rigorous drug testing in baseball or more help for athletes who don't feel they are worthy once their careers have ended. But we all struggle for our own badges of dignity and respect. Perhaps there are just brutal facts to face. When he wasn't on the diamond, Ken Caminiti wrestled with demons that even those closest to him did not understand. There are some things that we know for sure. Ken's fellow players loved him, and he was one terrific ball player. Rick Licht told the LA Times, every hero has his fatal flaws, whether it's an Achilles heel or kryptonite. The guy was so strong and determined on the baseball field, but he was not able to carry it over off the field. I don't know why. We'll never know why. Long retired and enshrined in the Baseball Hall of Fame, Craig Biggio is now the proud father of a son who has made the big leagues. He also still owns Cambo Ranch in Sabinal, Texas, in the deep south of the state. For years, Thanksgiving dinner at Cambo Ranch included the Caminitis. Nancy and her three daughters would trek nearly four hours west of Houston to be with the Biggios, and Ken was there as well, and not just in spirit. In 2006, his ashes were laid to rest under a mighty 300-year-old oak tree on the property. It's a peaceful place where Ken Caminiti can finally rest free of his demons and be by his best friend's side forever. If there's one thing that you could let people know about Ken and, and who he was, what, what, what would that be? Just stop bashing him. You know, he, 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 he was a human guy. He made, he made mistakes, but he was human. You know, he was a real good guy. And if they knew him as well as they say that they did, then they shouldn't be talking so much about him the way they do sometimes, you know? Ken was, Ken was like any other person. He was, he was human. He made mistakes. You know, celebrate him. This has been Season 1 of Secondary Lead, The Rise and Fall of Ken Caminiti. To learn more about Ken Caminiti, be on the lookout for an upcoming book by Dan Good. It's called Playing Through the Pain, The Life of Ken Caminiti and the Steroids Confession that Changed Baseball Forever.
The book is scheduled for publication in spring 2022. On the next season of Secondary Lead, we take a look at one of Ken Caminiti's teammates and one of the most bizarre endings of a career in baseball history. Coming this spring, it's the story of Derek Bell and Operation Shutdown. Please remember to subscribe to this podcast and leave a rating or a review and spread the word by telling a friend. Follow us at Secondary Lead on Twitter and Instagram. Like our Facebook page and check out show extras on YouTube. Music is courtesy of purpleplanet.com and the YouTube Audio Library. Our theme was written and performed by Jim Montgomery and Chris Cottrell. I'm your host, Joe Basile. Thanks for listening.